come. These people, I mean, for a person to be enlightened, have the heavenly gift of the Holy Ghost, the good word of God, the powers of the world to come, this is clearly a saved person. Moreover, in the context of the entire book of Hebrews, it is a book written to saved people. Not only is it a book written to saved people, but it has a purpose and it has an admonition and it has a goal. It is a passage of warning for us. Because it is a passage of warning, we need to figure out what the warning is. And the warning is, is if a believer falls away, then there comes a point where if a believer falls far enough away from God, then judgment is going to be the only recourse. We'll see this further in uh, chapter 10 in its warning passage. But when a believer falls away from Christ, then hardens his heart, God doesn't force him to repentance. God gives a believer chances to repent, but does not make him repent. And when a believer does this, he puts Christ to shame. He puts the testimony of Christ to shame. Now, Christ has already died on the cross. Their offering for sin has already been made. There is no more offering for sin. And there can come a point where a believer, in verse 8, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. This uh, counter-reference for this is, If a man abide not in Christ, he is gathered as branches, or, uh, or men gather them as branches, and they are cast into the fire, and they are burned, in John 15. And a believer uh, can come to a point where, as the Apostle Paul said, uh, but I uh, keep my body under, lest when I have preached to my, when I have preached to others, I myself become a castaway. It is a very dangerous thing for a believer to set at naught God and His commands, to turn aside with a hardened heart. And I've met believers who've decided to turn completely away from the things of God, and they're miserable people. They're miserable, cynical, bitter, and they have all kinds of problems in their life, and they can't figure out why. But there's always a chance for a person to get right. This passage is not teaching that a person cannot be made right with God ever again. It is teaching, though, that judgment is the only possible remedy for a believer who turns so far away from God. Yes? Paul also said in Thessalonians that there would be a falling away in the end times. And there's a lot of people that fit in that category there. Well, that's that for the just... people who remain, though. Yeah, the falling away actually is uh, something else. That The uh, falling away there, I believe, is referred to as the rapture. Um, it, uh... I don't have time to... Uh, discuss it in detail right now, but it uh, basically that falling away, I believe, is talking about the rapture. But the people who are left on yeah. the earth after Jesus is coming, right? No. He's, is that that's not, he's not, he doesn't, he's talking about. No, no. Okay, that so falling so. away is something else. That's the rapture. It uh, the antichrist won't be revealed unless the falling away, the rapture happens first. Um, that's what that's talking about, I believe. That is also another passage which is frequently disputed as to its meaning. That uh, passage in Thess 2 Thessalonians. Yeah, you will hear many, if you read any commentaries, you will see many different people's opinions on it. But I think the scripture is pretty clear. Usually the reason people come up with a lot of different meanings to something is because they have a theological axe to grind and they're trying to prove a point and they come across a passage whose, va whose meaning may be somewhat vague, and they try to read into it things which aren't there so as they can prove a point which they already have proved in their own mind. Well, for sake of time, we must bump ourselves forward. Number B, letter B, the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. Why I can never get number and letter straight is very unclear in my mind, but I really can't. So you'll just forgive me along those lines, please, because I always call them each other. Superiority of the New Covenant or the Old Covenant, Hebrews chapters 8 through 10, the more excellent ministry of the New Covenant, Hebrews chapter 8. 
Now, it says here, let's see, uh, the more excellent ministry of the New Covenant is more excellent, one, because it has an eternal tabernacle, not a tabernacle on earth. Uh, verse 5, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, saith he, that thou make all the things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So Moses, when he built the tabernacle, built it off a heavenly blueprint. Apparently, the things of the tabernacle on earth, God showed him a heavenly blueprint of. Apparently, the real Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. And uh, what Moses made was a earthly replica of the heavenly blueprint. Well, the uh, eternal tabernacle, the one Jesus ministered in and paid his blood on, is not on this earth, it is in heaven, and therefore it is better. And Jesus is a minister of better promises and a better covenant. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established unto better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. But there was fault with the first covenant, and that is that the law cannot make us righteous, it can only point out our sin. A surgeon's knife cannot bring life. It can only cut off what is dead. Well, but finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And he goes on here to reiterate the new covenant, which is uh, in Jeremiah chapters 31, verse 31 through 33. And uh, the point of that covenant is, of course, people being made right with God and uh, declared righteous in God's sight, having a new heart put in them, a heart after God. Well, the greater tabernacle and better sacrifice of the new covenant. So it has a more excellent ministry, and it has a greater tabernacle and a better sacrifice. Jesus' tabernacle and his priestly service are better than Aaron's. Now, uh, Hebrews 9, the first 10 verses, talks about uh, Aaron's ministry. And it talks about how the uh, sacrifices, how he would go in once a year and offer blood upon the, uh, the uh, mercy seat. It talks about these sort of things. And it, in verse 9 it says, it's a, Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the sacrifice perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So you had all these things going on, all the ministries of the tabernacle, but as it says in chapters 9, um, not chapter 9, where is that? <clears throat> I don't remember where it is, but it talks about there, oh, in chapter 10, verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. All these things of the Aaronic priesthood, they were just a shadow of the good things to come. We will skip the three sub-points there for sake of time. Um, no, we won't. We will skip the first two sub-points for sake of time and move on to the third sub-point. But the first sub-point basically is Jesus himself he offered himself as a superior sacrifice to uh, the sacrifices of the law. They pointed to him, but he was the superior sacrifice himself. Jesus died once for all to save everybody. He only died one time. His death is commemorated in the Lord's Supper, but it is not reenacted. The Lord's Supper does not become the body and blood of Christ. It is simply a symbol of it. <clears throat> now, Jesus is offering once for all, it brings in remission of sins. It brings in the effect of the new covenant. Hebrews 10.10 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, 
sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore saith the Holy Ghost also is a witness, wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these things is, there is no more offering for sin. So once for all, we are cleaned from our sins. Aaron's priesthood had to offer every morning a sacrifice, every evening a sacrifice, once per year a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. They had to offer a series of sacrifices for the Passover. They had to offer a series of sacrifices on other days and for other feasts. They had, and throughout every day, the sacrifices of the people coming in, sin offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings, all these sacrifices for sin, but they never put away the sins permanently. They paid for the sins in a figure. Christ is the one who paid for the sins, and they were a figure, if you will. They were the shadow of what Christ would do. But these things didn't purge the conscience from sins. These things, um, these things were weak and beggarly, as it's described in Galatians. They did not do the effect of the new covenant. The effect of the new covenant, having God's law written into our hearts, that is through the death of Christ and his resurrection for us. So living in light of the new covenant, Roman numeral 2, chapter 10, verses 19 through 39, and we have some reasons why to live in light of the new covenant. First, we see in uh, Hebrews 10, 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. These uh, three verses are echoing three verses earlier in Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 4, 16. Hebrews 4, 16 says... Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews six nineteen through 20, we read earlier, talks about how we have the, this hope, which is steadfast and sure, which is already entered in the veil for us. Christ already torn down that middle wall of partition for us. We have... A new high priest, we saw about that in 7, 24 through 28, who ever liveth to make intercession for us. Because of these things we have for us, basically because of everything which has been described previously in the book of Hebrews, because of these things we have some admonishments, 22 through 25. The first admonishment is to draw near to God. Hebrews 22 1022, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So draw near to God. What this verse is saying is basically with a clean heart, with your heart made right with God, your sins confessed, draw near to God. Because God has done all this for you, you can have a walk with Christ with a clean heart, and full fellowship in Christ because Christ has paid the offering for your sins. Hold fast to the faith. Hebrews 10.23 Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So draw near to God and then hold fast. Don't give up. Don't get dissuaded by any kind of arguments of men. Don't get uh, turned aside by uh, any kind of trouble or distress. Hold fast the faith. Then the admonishment is to provoke each other. Provoking people is one of my favorite things, unfortunately. When I was young, I was well known for being able to provoke my sister Elizabeth, and uh, she could never bother me back. I could provoke her to no end of distraction. And um, it's a skill I try to use as little as possible. It's not really good to provoke other people. 
But uh, here the Bible says to provoke one another to love and good works. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We as believers have a responsibility to our fellow believers to help each other to grow in Christ. To provoke each other to love and to good works. Almost, if you will, I dare you to go on door-to-door -door visitation. Not quite like that, but uh, um, to encourage each other and to try to help each other to live for Christ. Well, verse 25, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So then we're admonished not to forsake the assembly. Not to forsake, that is, the, uh, the collective gathering together of the body of Christ. That is, go to church. And then we have some warnings, 1026 through 31. This warning passage echoes the warning passage of chapter 6, but uh, echoes it a little bit more loudly. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The historical context of this is, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians, who are considering turning away from Christ, turning back into Judaism, the historical warning really would be if they turned back into Judaism, they would be eliminated when Rome came and destroyed Israel and killed about two million Jews. But the uh, spiritual warning of this for them and for us is if a person turns away from God and hardens his heart to a certain point, there remains only judgment. And it's not because the person can't get right, it's because the person won't get right. There is a huge difference there. It is not that we can sin so much that we can fall off a cliff that we can never be made right with God, but we can sin so much and turn our hearts so far away from God, the only way God can turn us around again to Him is severe punishment. Now, this is not, when it says, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of truth, this is not simply, I know I shouldn't lie, but I decided to lie anyway. But I think it's more what it's talking about is a heart which hardens itself. For example, the uh, example that it's talking about here, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses, is talking about a person, really, uh, the main reference here, I believe, would be in Numbers, and it, the God talked about if a person sins presumptuously, he dies. And you read in the next few verses about a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And there had been numerous warnings about uh, working on the Sabbath. And it seems that this man was gathering sticks on the Sabbath day with a rebellious heart of, ha, I'm going to judge stick, gather sticks on the Sabbath day and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Well, he got stoned. And that's that sort of thing. Or Achan, for example, Clear warning, do not grab the stuff out of Jericho. Achan fetches the stuff out of Jericho and was stoned because of it. Ananias and Sapphira also come to mind here. And they're lying to the Holy Spirit. And this uh, disobedience is, however, on the other hand, in our mind is often a small thing. We think that uh, disobedience it, um, and minor things are just minor things. The sin, I was reading in this uh, book by R.A. Torrey of the Holy Spirit, sin is never a small thing. We can sin concerning small things, but sin itself is never a small thing. The example he used is if a child takes a book and his parent says, give me the book, and the child throws the book down and says, no, well, a book being on the floor is a small thing, but a child's rebellious heart against his parent is a very large thing. And our rebellion against God is never a small thing, 
but it can come to a point where if we decide to have a rebellious heart which says, no, God, no, absolutely I won't, then punishment is severe and is deserved. But in verse 32, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated you endured a great fight of afflictions. And in verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. Encouragement is don't cast away your confidence. You've gone this far for Christ, don't throw it all away in a moment of rebellion. Don't uh, harden your heart against God. Don't turn away from Him. But live for Christ and receive all the rewards of Christ. The New Covenant... God gave to us to change us. The Mosaic Law couldn't. A person cannot grab the Ten Commandments, decide he is going to live them, which if a man do, he shall live in them. But the problem is we can't do them. So God gave us this new covenant to bring into effect the holiness and righteousness of God in our lives. This is what God wants in our lives, is for us to have that heart of flesh to take out that heart of stone, to give us a heart to obey him and to walk after him. And this new covenant, we, as, saw, as we saw last week, we partake in first by being saved and then we receive its blessings by obedience. We see this week about um, us encouragements, uh, the contrast of the new covenant to the old covenant and how much better the new covenant is and encouragements and warnings to live in light of the new covenant. Rebels will be severely punished. Turning back from Christ is a horrible thing which will be avenged by God. But that doesn't have to be us. And it doesn't have to be any of us. Obedience and disobedience are both a choice. They don't happen. Neither happens by accident. Both are intentional. So we as believers, we all have a great opportunity to live for Christ but a great danger if we choose to rebel. The conclusion is, and the uh, concluding, I guess, encouragement is, is live for Christ and receive all those tremendous blessings of the new covenant we saw last week. Answered prayer, fellowship in Christ, fullness of joy, and all these wonderful things. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word for us and thank you for your great goodness to us. Help us to live in light of the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, this concludes our series on the Bible covenants. Next week we will begin a study concerning...